It's my extreme pleasure to um, uh, introduce one of the major figures in the Department of Medicine uh, and, and also in the medical staff to, who's going to give us grand rounds today. Dr. Sizemore uh, is, a, is a local local kid done good. Uh, he's uh, 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 went to a Duke University for his undergraduate degree. He uh, graduated from the University of Tennessee College of Medicine. He did uh, 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 his uh, residency at a hospital in Baltimore, uh, no, not the University of Maryland, um, Johns Hopkins. He did a uh, infectious disease fellowship at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and has a master's of science in, in public health. Uh, he returned to uh, Chattanooga after doing about one year, was it one year at UAB, he came and, and returned to Chattanooga in 2005 and has been involved in the ID group uh, and uh, in, in um, Chattanooga. He's also an assistant professor in the department. He's the head of our clinical competency committee uh, as a stalwart in our educational programs. He's also involved in, he's the medical director of the antimicrobial stewardship and infection program. He's the medical director of Chattanooga Cares, which is the Ryan White um, uh, HIV uh, uh, infected uh, clinic serving the HIV infected uh, patients in our population. And he's also the chief of staff of Erlanger Me Medical, uh, the Erlanger Medical staff. So we're just so thrilled that in his spare time, he's been able to come and prepare a talk for us. And so I give you Jay Sizemore. Great. So thanks, Lou. Uh, this is a new talk for me uh, today. I have uh, pulled from, from some other talks uh, that I've given, but I've also pulled from the what's been published uh, in the literature or reported uh, from the CDC and other bodies over the last one to two years uh, and hope to bring this information uh, to you today uh, to put it to use. I'm going to focus primarily, as you might expect, uh, on uh, issues dealing with antimicrobial stewardship, uh, but I'm also going to touch on the areas of HIV, uh, STDs, and uh, vaccines, and hopefully we're going to have a conversation about how we can take what's being reported in the literature and incorporate it into what you're doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Before I do that, and I've selected the round number 10, 10 topics that I'm going to cover, I want to talk a little bit about the ID specialty and where we are as a specialty and how you and others can help us uh, move forward to, to disseminate uh, both ID knowledge and be good stewards of antibiotics. So we are a limited resource that is becoming uh, uh, more so in a time of greater need. We do, uh, as any specialty do, does, provide uh, added value uh, to patient care uh, of, of, uh, of infected patients, but we need a team approach to be as effective as we can be uh, in moving forward. So this is a perfect storm in a challenging environment, and it's simple supply and demand. The demand for infectious diseases physicians is up especially as we'll talk about in a few minutes with the requirement uh, that every acute care facility and LTAC facility have an antimicrobial stewardship program. The salaries are low, uh, and that's driven the supply down. So, um, you know, why would you want to do a medicine, re why would you want to do an infectious diseases fellowship when you could come out of medicine residency and go work as a hospitalist and make more money after you would, after, uh, you, instead of doing two more years or three more years of fellowship and coming out uh, and making less. So our supply is down, our unfilled fellow slots are up, uh, and the scenarios of patient care with respect to infectious diseases are becoming more complicated, primarily being driven uh, by multi-drug resistant organisms, as well as the increasing proportion of, of our uh, population that is not only aged, but uh, immunosuppressed. This is an example of a report from the Infectious Diseases Society of America that outlines uh, the uh, issue of unfilled uh, fellow slots. Uh, it's, uh, in 2016, was on the order of only about 65 percent filling. In 2017, it was slightly up uh, to 80 percent, but our, uh, our supply is definitely dwindling. This is one example that we've implemented here 
uh, at Erlanger as to how infectious diseases uh, consultants bring value to care. Uh, this is not the only way and this is not new news, but it's just an example that we like to use and that's one of the reasons uh, that our stewardship program suggested and our medical staff supported uh, routine automatic infectious diseases consultation uh, for folks with Staph aureus bacteremia. <clears throat> But again, we have to be creative in how we do this because this is only going to increase. Our demand is decreasing, so we have to be creative in our approaches. Okay, one of the ways to do that is EPIC. So there's a dot phrase for that. So if you don't, if you if you want to get a head start on managing your patient with Staph aureus bacteremia, here's a way to do it. This is basically the outline that we follow on how we're going to manage folks with Staph aureus bacteremia. So this is a resource that you can turn to that's going to be pretty quick and going to give you an idea of what you need, uh, what you need to be doing. We also have to rely on a collaborative team approach to optimize uh, these outcomes. It obviously starts with the ID specialist at the top. I certainly want to acknowledge our ID pharmacist uh, here, Kyle White. I think many, if not everybody in the room knows Kyle. Um, he's available via Tiger Connect or uh, uh, via his cell phone. Um, you know, Kyle has been an invaluable uh, resource, not only to the infectious disease service, but I think to everybody uh, in the room. And certainly pharmacists provide value uh, in, in other areas uh, of medicine, but I just can't tell you uh, how important it has been in moving our not only our whole ID program, but our stewardship program uh, forward. Willing administrators, our administrators uh, since really 2007 uh, have been very supportive of, uh, uh, of driving infectious diseases care, primarily through support, uh, supporting our stewardship program. Um, advanced practice providers are pervasive uh, in medicine. Uh, we've, not, uh, we've not deployed them in the area of infectious diseases yet, but we're certainly uh, interested in them. We have uh, collaborative relationships with infection preventionists as well as microbiology staff, uh, but we really uh, ultimately rely on you all, the, me the other medical staff members, the students and the residents um, in this room uh, to be committed not only in this area of medicine, but all areas of medicine uh, to, to continue to uh, want to learn uh, throughout your careers. It just happens with infectious diseases. I think uh, somewhat more than other specialties, it's become clear that the way most of us was, were trained uh, was maybe uh, incorrect and suboptimal. And then as I'll allude to in just a minute, again, given the short supply, given the fact that most acute care hospitals under 200 beds don't have infectious diseases physicians, We've got to become effective in how we're going to deploy uh, telemedicine uh, to help providers who are working at these uh, smaller institutions. So that's where we are uh, with uh, the specialty of infectious diseases. So next I want to turn uh, to antimicrobial stewardship, uh, focus on a couple of things, uh, primarily the JCO requirement now that, that acute care facilities have uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs. And one of the most challenging things about having a stewardship program is how do you change uh, adult behavior? And how do you change adult behavior in a, in a field where there are typically a lot of type A uh, personalities? Uh, but before I get to that, um, I, I, I show you this just because it was published uh, in, the, in the last few months uh, by my uh, by our professional society, the Infectious Disease Society of America, um, not because of what the title is, but I just wanted to read you a case vignette as to how, uh, from this article, as to how stewardship is important and how the lack of stewardship or recognition of this team approach uh, can lead to a bad outcome. And this is an example of something that we see uh, on an ongoing basis. So this is a 60-year-old man with type 2 diabetes, he was admitted with, uh, from home with a diagnosis of severe sepsis. Blood cultures were obtained. Broad spectrum antimicrobials were started in the emergency department and the patient was admitted to the ICU. The next day, the blood cultures grew highly susceptible bacteria as determined by a new polymerase chain reaction based identification method. 
<clears throat> the pharmacist uh, 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 appropriately talked through the stewardship program about changing to a narrow, more narrow spectrum antimicrobial. However, the patient's physician was reticent to act on the advice of a non-physician and continued broad spectrum antimicrobials. The pharmacist was frustrated as he not, did not have an ID physician leader to help support her recommendation by reaching out to the provider. While the patient was recovering from the bloodstream infection, he developed C. difficile colitis. Due to the severe colonic inflammation, he subsequently developed a second bloodstream infection, this time caused by an intestinal organism that was highly antimicrobial resistant, another consequence of broad spectrum antimicrobial use. Although he eventually was stabilized after a three-week hospital stay, he was unable to care for himself at home and went to a long-term acute care uh, facility. While there, C. difficile was transmitted uh, to his roommate whose discharge was delayed due to this complication. So again, it just shows you how there can be downstream effects uh, that, that will often go largely unrecognized uh, if we're not good stewards um, of uh, antibiotics. And there is this, uh, there is this uh, per pervasive thought process amongst some providers. If, if somebody's getting better uh, on Piptazo to an AMP-sensitive E. coli, why in the world would we change it? They're getting better. Well, they're going to get better on ampicillin too. Um, but we just, and, 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 and we'll go into the details as we move through this. So this is the Joint Commission standard. Uh, we had our Joint Commission survey, as many of you know, last year. Um, and uh, being a new standard, it was something that they were, uh, they were, it was top of mind uh, during our discussion with them for, for them to know how we were uh, implementing the program. They based their standard on the seven core elements that were uh, released by the CDC with respect to antimicrobial stewardship. Um, really, with six out of these seven, we're doing really well. We do have leadership uh, commitment. Uh, we do have accountability. We do have a drug expert. Uh, we do take action. Uh, with EPIC, we're still working uh, on the tracking piece and to some extent on the reporting piece, though we do produce uh, an um, antibiogram. Uh, and, we're, and in venues like this, we're able to move forward uh, with our education uh, to not only our medical staff members, but to also our students uh, and residents. Again, as I alluded to earlier, uh, stewardship in smaller hospitals is more uh, uh, difficult um, and w when, there's, when there's not uh, on-site uh, presence. But again, if you can deploy uh, your medical staff leaders as well as your pharmacy colleagues uh, and uh, uh, pair that to some extent with uh, some remote medicine, if not telemedicine, uh, that will drive outcome in this environment of diminishing resources. This is what a sample stewardship note looks like uh, here at Erlanger. Uh, you may have uh, seen these. Um, we have a special antimicrobial stewardship type note, so it's different than your infectious. It's, that's the service uh, that's reported. Uh, this is a sample of what we might uh, report. And then uh, Kyle has put together this disclaimer at the bottom of the note, which annotates that we're not, this is not a formal infectious uh, disease consultation. But this is, uh, this is obviously our suggestions, our guidance, our employing our uh, antimicrobial stewardship policy as supported uh, by our PNN committee and our, and our uh, medical staff uh, leaders. But this is what you can expect uh, to see. So with all that being said about stewardship, stewardship is not going away. So we have to figure out ways uh, to, um, to modify uh, adult behavior. And so somehow this journal uh, landed on my desk. I don't even know who puts it out, but it's called uh, Infectious Disease Special Edition. So I'm not even really sure what the source of this was, uh, but something on it uh, uh, caught my eye and I started uh, flipping through it and, it, and uh, it, uh, this, this article on behavior change, uh, being an undergraduate psychology major, uh, resonated uh, with me as an uh, interesting topic for uh, discussion. And um, it's particularly uh, pertinent uh, to students and residents and the environment uh, that they have to work in. So again, I'd like to read something from this article. 
Uh, these are some British, some of our British colleagues. The research focused on what physicians in training do in the presence of challenge, challenges, inter, inexperience, and lack of knowledge in antibiotic decision making. They found physicians in, tra in training operate uh, within challenging uh, context, including hierarchical relationships, uh, prescribing norms, unclear roles and responsibilities, expectation about knowledge level, fear of criticism, managing reputation and position on the team, and appearing competent. Does that sound familiar? Based on these challenges, a physician in training will decide to follow senior, senior physician's prescribing habits in such hierarchical, hierarchical environment where the rationale for prescribing antibiotics is rarely discussed, the stewardship program must make antibiotic resistant and stewardship everyone's business. Behavior change interventions should address key areas, including hierarchical learning, professional reputation and accountability, fitting in with the team, and local prescribing norms. So, keys to behavior change. My presentation to you has to be non-threatening. Unfortunately, I don't come across that way to a lot of people. So that's something that I've struggled with uh, for the decade that we've uh, been doing this. Kyle and I want to be viewed as a resource to you uh, and not Big Brother. We need to leave, everybody needs to leave their ego at the door. There needs to be a willingness to change. We need to recognize uh, this hierarchical learning. We need to, on our team, we encourage everybody on the team to teach. If they know something that I don't know, I want them to teach me. Um, there's too much uh, in medicine for everybody to know everything, uh, and the devil's in the details. So if you're too busy uh, to deal with every issue that your patient might be having, you therefore should be open if there is somebody with a greater knowledge level than you who might could help you help your patient have a better outcome. It's really uh, logical, um, but it's often at least uh, in pockets of this institution uh, not, uh, uh, not applied. So we want to be a resource. Uh, we want ultimately the same outcome, and that's what's best for our patient. We really try to steer clear uh, in our stewardship recommendations of anything that's controversial. Uh, but at the end of the day, we all need to be accountable uh, to ourselves, to the institution, and most importantly, uh, our patients. So just a few tips on, on the next uh, couple of slides uh, with respect to how you can be a better antibiotic steward. So the first, again, is an acknowledgement that the way that we were all taught, uh, and again, I always go back to my grandfather who passed away a couple of years ago, graduated medical school in 1944, right when penicillin was coming around, uh, if, you know, it was from that point forward that everybody overemphasized the benefits of antibiotics and underemphasized the risk, and it's led us into this uh, conundrum that we're in today with antimicrobial resistance. I would encourage everybody to explore, if you haven't already, the fever tab uh, in EPIC. Uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great resource. It uh, details uh, white blood cell count, temperature, uh, gives you links to cultures as well as uh, antibiotics that your patient has been on. Um, it helps with antibiotic count and notoriously providers, at least in, uh, that we look at, uh, are not very, uh, not very good at that. We need to de-escalate or stop antibiotics quick, quickly. Uh, there's many uh, publications now that suggest a 48-hour antibiotic timeout, much like the timeouts that are carried out uh, prior to surgical procedure. Does it still make sense today, 48 hours later, now with all the additional knowledge that we've gained to keep this patient uh, on antibiotics? Or is there evidence to suggest that we can give a more narrow spectrum antibiotic? Check the outside cultures and count the outside antibiotic days. Um, so again, without, with, uh, without sounding harsh, do you really want me to call the micro lab and call you and tell you that there's a positive culture that you don't know about? I mean, that's not really what we want. We're happy to do it. We do it every day. Um, but again, if your patient's transferred in, as an increasing proportion of our patients are, they're transferred in from another institution, as painful it is, as it is, we've got to call and get the outside culture data. Again, our recommendation is to call the microbiology lab directly. 
And most of the time, if you identify yourself as a physician, as someone who's being and, and caring for a patient who's been transferred from their facility, we don't really get resistance from getting the culture data. Counting outside antibiotic days. So we had a guy just this week we were consulted on, an immunosuppressed patient with an odontogenic infection who was transferred from Hamilton for further evaluation of his oncologic care. Um, and uh, again, uh, it, it would be very easy for someone to say he's currently on day three of unison when in fact this guy had been on 10 days of effective therapy for an odontogenic infection. So again, it's not good enough to just count the days of antibiotics that they've had uh, while, they're, while they're at Erlanger. Again, recognizes, I recognize everybody's busy, there's a lot of expectations out there, but this is what promotes best patient care. Holding antibiotic in clinically stable patients where culture data is incomplete. I've talked to the residents about this before. Uh, where this is most pertinent or most common is in diabetic feed and discitis. As you know, most people who come in with diabetic foot infections, they didn't happen overnight. And most of them are clinically stable. So again, it's a very simple algorithm. You know, you can get blood cultures, sed rate, CRP, get the appropriate imaging, don't do a superficial culture get your surgeon on board and get a bone biopsy if appropriate. It's the same algorithm every time. Same thing with uh, discitis. Don't treat asymptomatic bacteria. This is another chronic problem. Again, there's a strong temptation uh, that's been passed down over time for providers to treat every positive culture that you see. This gets us, uh, this gets us into trouble. And then access the guidelines that are available to you. And again, I refer you to the IDSA website, idsociety.org, where there is a guidelines tab and free access uh, to the evidence-based uh, uh, guidelines that are out there. So rationale, these are things that I want to be going through your mind as you're thinking about how you're using antibiotics. Does the risk-benefit ratio of the antibiotic I am prescribing today favor continuing? That's, that may change from day to day. It may change if you had planned a 10-day course and now your patient is diagnosed with C. difficile. That changes. Are there more likely diagnosis, diagnoses today than there were yesterday? So you thought the patient had pneumonia, but now they have heart failure. Does it make sense to continue antibiotics uh, in that setting? What bugs am I trying to cover? <clears throat> So this is important and something that you need to be able to ask yourself every day. And I'm going to talk about vancomycin and zosin later, but if vancomycin and zosin are what you're going to be giving, you, you need to know uh, what you're covering with those two agents, essentially everything, but you need to know why. Why are you doing it? Why is MRSA in your differential? Why is Pseudomonas uh, in your differential? Um, and that's know and knowing the spectrum of your anti the antibiotics you're using. So for some of the more common bugs, Pseudomonas and Staph aureus, just another example. It would be relevant, especially for the residents, to know what are the agents that cover Pseudomonas? What are the agents that we use for serious Staph aureus infections? Sicker does not necessarily equal, equal broader. All right, penicillin-sensitive pneumococcus kills people. All right, so if somebody's coming in from the community and they're sick, that doesn't necessarily mean they need vanxosin, okay? Okay, if they're coming in from the community, they're allowed to be sick. They're allowed to die from being it, from a serious community-acquired uh, infection. So that's another thing that often, uh, th th those are lines that often uh, uh, get blurred. So access guidelines, again, I can't overemphasize uh, that enough. All right, so our next project and our third topic this morning is, is uh, laboratory stewardship. And this can take multiple different um, avenues and it's going to involve multiple different teams but how it involves you is you want to order with a purpose okay we're not we're, we've got to get rid of the shotgun approach you're going to order with a purpose okay so we're not going to rote order UAs on people who are not having dysuria and who we're not evaluating for proteinuria again we're going to use a stepwise progression rather than the shotgun approach we're going to support protocols, and we're going to anticipate uh, results. So this was recently published uh, as a commentary in uh, clinical infectious diseases. 
looking at uh, opportunities for laboratory and infectious diseases partnership. And Kyle and I are going to be actively working uh, with our lab uh, at Erlanger to try to institute some protocols. So this is an example of an opportunity. So this is a patient who came in with possible meningitis. Okay, and again, some of these orders are obviously duplicated. We're still getting, we're all still getting used to EPIC. Um, but this is an opportunity for improvement. When is HSV, IgG, and IgM, CSF ever relevant? Ever. It's on our panel. It's on our CSF panel. I don't know how to pull it up, but I know if you pull it up, you're going to get this test, and it's getting ordered all the time now. And in fact, I got a call from a hospitalist last week on a discharge patient wanting to know what he needed to do because the antibody came back positive. This is an irrelevant test that should never be ordered, but it's, it's in the panel. But you can see here all the other tests that potentially could be relevant in a patient with meningitis, but that don't necessarily need to be ordered up front. Let's start with the basics. Cell count, protein, glucose, differential, culture. We hope to soon have our meningitis encephalitis panel in place, the biofire. But we don't need to, you know, we don't need to go off on cryptococcal antigen, uh, CSF, VDRL, HSV on every patient. Let's see what the cell count is. If the cell count's zero, you know, we don't need to have all these other tests in queue. It takes up our lab resource time, it costs money, and it's not going to help your, you or your patient, uh, you deliver care or your patient's outcome. Similarly, this is the fever tab, an example of the fever tab I wanted to show you guys. This is a patient we were fortunate uh, to get consulted on. Okay, so you got temperature going up here, it's normal, everything's going along well. This is an ICU patient. And then boom, on the 9th of May, their white count goes to 25. Okay? So fortunately, and in the, major in the minority of situations, this patient didn't get started on antibiotics, but there were some cultures done. So the first thing about laboratory stewardship that I want you to think about is why in the heck are we getting CBCs on this patient every day? Is that, is that really helping what we're doing? I want you to be thinking about that. What is the CBC that you're ordering today on your patient helping you do? Is it helping you feel comfortable that they're responding to an infection and you just like to watch the number come down? You know, are you just ordering it because that's what your attending told you to do or that's what I've always done? Um, we need to be thinking about that because more often than not, this patient gets cultures, they're in the ICU, they get put on vancxosin, okay? <clears throat> really regardless of what their cultures show, um, but even if they were positive in a chronically ventilated patient, Three days later, that patient's white count is normal. So we have, a, again, a pervasive thought process where we connect these two. This patient had a high white count. They were afebrile. I started antibiotics, and their white blood cell count came down. My antibiotics that I prescribed made that white blood cell count come down. This happens all the time. Fortunately, I don't know how this happened. We got consulted. The guy was relatively stable uh, intracranial catastrophe, but relatively stable, monitored off uh, antibiotics, additional antibiotics, and he ended up doing well. Asymptomatic bacteria. This is a common problem, and this is taken from the, the IDSA guidelines in 2005, somewhat dated, but un really unchanged. Right? So this gets to the point of what the ramifications are if you order UAs, on asympt UAs and urine cultures on asymptomatic patients. If you've got somebody with an indwelling catheter use long term, 100% of those people are going to have bacteria. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about anticipating results. If you order a urine culture on a patient with, long -term, with a long term catheter, you can expect that culture to be positive, and you need to be prepared to act on that positive culture. And so it's a lot easier, I think, on the front end 
if, if that's not really a consideration, not to order the, not to order the culture. What about somebody coming from a, a long-term care facility? And, you know, our population is aging and we're seeing those people. If we're doing routine UAs, and again, you, there, there's lots of asymptomatic pyuria as well that will, even with our policy, reflex to culture. Um, and then you're gonna be dealt with a culture. And then if you're in the mindset that I'm gonna treat every culture that I see, uh, then you know, there's lots of unnecessary antibiotic use uh, that goes on. So other examples, stool studies, again, stool white blood cells, uh, stool cultures, O and P, in the large majority of patients are not gonna be helpful. And lots of times those just get rote ordered on anybody with diarrhea. We'll come back to C. diff in a second. Superficial wound cultures for diabetic foot infections or sacral decubiti, not helpful. AFB fungal valve or knee cultures in a patient with, with Staph aureus bacteremia, not helpful, done all the time. Those patients go down to the OR, the circulators have a checklist. Viral cultures in orthopedics, when was the last time that you saw a septic arthritis caused by a virus? You know, in the adult world, that doesn't happen. You know, but these are boxes that are just getting checked. These are healthcare costs that are occurring uh, and they provide no value to the patient. Lyme test in patients with chronic fatigue, our most dreaded outpatient consult. If you order enough Lyme test in a non-endemic area, you're, just by the test characteristics themselves, you're gonna get some positive tests. Uh, viral load on HIV inpatients, I've talked to the residents about that. That's not gonna be helpful information to you. It's a send out, you're not gonna get it back for three to five days. And in general, you're not gonna act on that. You know, the only time that you might act on it is, or order it is if you suspected acute HIV infection where the antibody might be negative. Our other dreaded outpatient consult is serial EBV titers. So somebody's been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus, but they wanna keep checking the titers to see if, they've, if they're trending. Well, that's, that doesn't make sense. Your EBV, EBV titers are gonna be positive. There's nothing we're gonna do about it. So again, there, these examples go a long way, but just to let you know, this is what's coming. We're gonna work on trying to streamline uh, the way that we uh, order laboratory tests and provide you with tools to, uh, to do that. Man, Lou, I'm 30 minutes in and I'm only on number four. I'm gonna have to speed it up. <laughs> All right, C. difficile. Uh, this is important because there's new guidelines that were, uh, that were released in 2017, pub published uh, in uh, early 2018. Um, I wanna remind you uh, of the guidelines supported uh, change in algorithm that we're doing here for C. difficile testing. Uh, this suggests that there are two ways to do it, but look at what it requires you to do. Clinicians and laboratory personnel agree at the institutional level to not submit stool specimens on patients receiving laxatives uh, and to submit stool specimens only from patients with unexplained and new onset greater than or equal to three unformed stools in 24 hours for testing. I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, I hope we get there soon. If we were there that, if we were there now, we could have considered continuing the protocol that we were doing, which was just a straight nucleic acid amplification test or PCR. Uh, we're not there yet. This is something that the hospital reports. It's nationally reportable. So we've elected to go now with a combination assay using a PCR as a tiebreaker. So just wanted to let you know this is supported uh, in this most recent iteration of the guidelines. Treatment. Again, I think the important things to point out uh, for the sake of time, I would encourage each, each of you uh, to review uh, these guidelines, is the absence of metronidazole now as a first-line agent for C. difficile. So if you look at initial, initial uh, episode, non-severe, uh, we're looking at vancomycin 125, four times daily, 10 days, with fidaxomycin uh, as a second choice. Uh, if you don't know, fidaxomycin, a 10-day course, is on the order of $2,000, so it, is, uh, prohibitive, it can be prohibitively expensive, although with the release of the guidelines uh, and as time has gone by, I have seen outpatient coverage of this uh, antibiotic uh, increase. The other thing I want to point out is that nowhere on these guidelines do I see a 250-milligram dose of vancomycin. 
So we're either, we're either going to give 125 or in our sickest patients, we're going to give, uh, uh, we're going to give 500. And then there are other, you know, there are more uh, details that I won't get into with respect to what you do uh, with, uh, with a second episode. Um, but I did want to bring up the fact that uh, stool transplant moved up uh, in the guidelines uh, and our GI colleagues uh, have been willing uh, to graciously take over that on occasion from having us do it as we did a few years ago via uh, an NG tube. So uh, this is where we get our stool. This is Open Biome. This is a nonprofit uh, stool donor company in Boston. Um, so they pre-screen uh, and freeze dry stool and uh, th that stool can be requested to be sh uh, shipped uh, overnight. It then gets reconstituted in a slurry uh, and injected uh, via colonoscope. A highly, uh, uh, a highly effective therapy and if it was a little more palatable would probably be done uh, and had a little less issues with uh, FDA clearance would probably be done uh, much more often. Uh, I want to I want to bring your attention to uh, the risk of uh, C. difficile infection with tetracyclines, uh, and this was a systematic review and meta-analysis that Kyle brought to my attention. Again, published in uh, CID. This is not the only study like this that's out there. There are now multiple studies out there that really support the C. diff protective nature of tetracyclines. So if you have an opportunity to use a tetracycline uh, for treatment of an infection or a patient who's at risk or who has had uh, C. difficile and is at risk for relapse, doxycycline uh, is a great agent. For MRSA, it's also uh, uh, supported uh, by our antibiogram with over 90% of our isolates uh, 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 sensitive uh, to doxycycline compared to a much lower percentage to a high-risk agent like clindamycin. Penicillin allergy. So uh, I, know, uh, I know Dr. Davis is, uh, is, is, uh, is interested in this and getting uh, other folks interested in this uh, with respect to the bottom point on this slide and it's point of care beta-lactam allergy skin testing uh, here at Erlanger. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's great if we can work out an algorithm uh, to, to, to sort that out as to who does the testing and whatnot. But just taking a simple history and not taking the allergy for granted gets you uh, a, a, long, a, a long way. And there's now multiple studies that have been published in, in uh, more recent months that support this. So this was a, a little bit of an older study, but this was uh, the impact of a reported beta-lactam allergy on inpatient uh, outcomes. Uh, and it showed that it was, if you, if you had a beta-lactam allergy, uh, which is reported on, on the order of about 15 to 20 percent of patients, uh, you had an increased risk of an adverse outcome. This is a newer study looking at the impact of reported beta-lactam allergy amongst hospitalized patients with hematologic uh, malignancies. So they had a longer link, if you go down here to the results, a longer length of stay, 11 versus 7 days, higher mortality at 30 days and 180 days, a higher readmission rate, higher C. diff rate, and higher hospital charges. So this matters. It matters not only to the administrators at the hospital, but it should matter to you because it impacts uh, the outcome of your patients. This is another one, again, recently reported looking at penicillin allergy on surgical site infections. So people who reported a penicillin allergy had a 50% increase odds uh, of a surgical uh, side infection, largely related to the fact that they got second line uh, antibiotics. So again, we can do testing, we can go do graded challenges, sometimes uh, desensitization, but again, I fall back on taking 30 to 60 seconds to look at it to take a history. Make sure this is an allergy, not an adverse uh, event. Make sure it's not a stomach ache, it's nausea, vomiting, it's diarrhea. Tolerance of other beta-lactams is valuable information, okay? So if, if somebody says they're allergic to penicillin, the next question is, first, are you allergic to amoxicillin? No, I take amoxicillin all the time. Well, that patient's not penicillin allergic, okay? Then if they say, well, yeah, um, it was really amoxicillin that I had a reaction to, that gave me a rash. Oh, you, do you tolerate cephalexin, keflex, ceftriaxone, rocephin? Oh yeah, I tolerate that. Well, see, so, you know, you're not going to, right there, you're not going to eliminate 
the cephalosporin class. But if they have a non-anaphylactic, even if they have a non-anaphylactic reaction to penicillin, especially in the inpatient setting, we do this all the time. We, we give them the antibiotic if it's the first line antibiotic to give, okay? Because if you look at the studies that have been done, you take 1,000 patients who report a penicillin allergy, 100 of them are really allergic, and less than 3% of them will have a reaction to these other classes. So we're talking about three in 1,000. If you take the penicillin history at fa allergy at face value, only three in 1,000 would have a reaction. So if you, and if you're gonna eliminate you're going to eliminate cephalosporins in 1,000 patients, but if you take a history, you can get it down to three. I mean, it takes 30 to 60 seconds. And again, you know, Kyle and I can do this, but it, it probably doesn't make sense for us to do it because you can, uh, you can do it. All right, number six, picking up the pace here, vancomycin peptazo renal toxicity. So we want to avoid, not prescribe this combination if possible. Again, I show you only one example of a meta-analysis that's, uh, uh, that's been published looking at the use of vancomycin and peptazo, but there's at least four to five studies out there looking at this and comparing it with vancomycin and other beta-lactams. There is something about this combination that generates acute kidney injury, all right? That's why it's important to do an antibiotic timeout. MRSA tends not to hide. If you've not found MRSA at 48 hours, we need to be getting rid of the vancomycin, okay? If there are other viable beta-lactam options for your patient based on what you think they're at risk for and you still need vancomycin, we ought to avoid this combination. For our patients with, uh, for our patients with uh, pneumonitis or skin and soft tissue infections where we feel like we have to use multiple agents and they're at risk for kidney disease or we start to see their creatinine going up, Linazolid is an option for MRSA coverage in the absence of vancomycin for those uh, clinical settings. It's generic. The PO version is very cheap in the hospital now. We need to be looking at other options to avoid uh, this combination. MRSA PCR nasal swabs. They have great negative predictive value for patients where you are suspecting a hospital-acquired pneumonia. I bring you this study uh, published this year, look, but again, one of many that have been published looking at this uh, issue. This involved 11,000 patients suspected of having a nosocomial pneumonia, perhaps being started on linazolid or vancomycin. You do this test. We have this test here. They get batched, done at night, the results available the next day. If it is negative, there is a greater than 99% negative predictive value of this test for your patient having MRSA pneumonia. So we're looking for opportunities to get rid of the vancomycin. Our PNN committee yesterday supported a policy, a pharmacy-driven policy. We're, we're going to be looking at floor patients, uh, floor patients, more stable patients, less risk patients who are suspected of having hospital-acquired pneumonia. And if their, uh, PCR is, uh, if their PCR is negative, we are going to be auto discontinuing with notification of the provider uh, uh, of the vancomycin in that setting of a relatively stable floor patient. All right, so we're going to move off uh, the stewardship track to finish up with three uh, areas that I thought were interesting and that you should know about. Um, as you know from as the residents know from my vaccine lecture, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very big proponent of, a, of adult vaccination. I get to be an adult vaccinator uh, in my uh, HIV clinic, and the most relevant new material with respect uh, to vaccines is uh, shingles. Uh, before I get to that, I want to remind you about the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Um, that's the body uh, that works at the CDC under the auspices of the National Immunization Program uh, to meet three times yearly and generate adult and childhood vaccine schedules. The, we are great child vaccinators, but the strength of the recommendation between child and adult vaccines is no different. But we really struggle uh, with adult vaccination rates, not only compared to children, but also compared to other preventive health things that we do. So that's why I feel so strongly 
uh, about vaccination. So this came out uh, in, uh, in uh, early 2018, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. That's how the ACIP uh, reports out its recommendations. At its October 2017 meeting, it reviewed the data of the then recently approved uh, FDA, uh, FDA approved vaccine uh, Shingrix. Um, and this provided us with the official guidance uh, of how we're going to use uh, this vaccine. As you might recall, Zostavax was the previously available vaccine. This is a live attenuated vaccine. It was stored in a freezer. Uh, it was a single dose uh, sub Q administered uh, vaccine that had to be avoided uh, in immunocompromised. Uh, host. That vaccine had been around for approximately uh, a decade. Shingrix is the new vaccine. It is a recombinant, non-live, adjuvant VZV vaccine. And uh, basically the tone of the uh, guidance that was put out by the CDC is that this vaccine is recommended for adults 50 uh, years and older. It is recommended for adults who had previously received Zostavax because of greater efficacy rates and it is preferred over Zostavax. It's very unusual for the, there's lots of uh, uh, infections where we have vaccines where there's multiple manufacturers and just for baseline knowledge, it's very unusual uh, to have the ACIP prefer one vaccine over another, except in cases like this where there's clear efficacy. This, however, is a two dose series uh, that's uh, administered intramuscularly uh, on a zero and then two to six month schedule. So this vaccine uh, is, is available uh, now and uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should be regularly employing it as it is now an official part of the adult uh, uh, vaccine schedule. One uh, note uh, that is highlighted in this guidance as well is that we do not, we do not need to take a history uh, with respect to chicken pox, nor do we need to send a blood test with, to verify or deny uh, VZV uh, immunity prior to vaccinating uh, these individuals. So 99% of people over the age of 40 in this country have had exposure uh, to VZV. If for some reason you were to get a hold of information that you didn't generate that the patient happened to be VZV negative, um, then I would recommend you back to the guidance uh, for vaccination against uh, varicella. STDs. There's been two important things that have come uh, largely through uh, both the CDC and the uh, lay media uh, with respect to a HIV. The first is U equals U. I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, and the second is just to make everyone aware in the room uh, about the issue of resistant gonorrhea. So this was a letter uh, from the CDC that came out uh, on uh, National Gay Men's HIV AIDS Awareness Day on September 27th. Uh, of last year, uh, which really, uh, for the first time, changed the way we think about the transmissibility uh, of HIV. Uh, and it basically, just to get to jump to the point, uh, I'll, I'll direct you to this bottom statement. Uh, this means that people who take antiretroviral therapy daily as prescribed and achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load have effectively no risk of sexually transmitting the virus to an HIV negative partner. Right, so that really changes the scope of what we've been preaching over the last three decades uh, with respect to uh, uh, condom use, HIV uh, uh, prevention. And so I think that's uh, uh, incredibly important and, and it speaks to uh, where we are with HIV uh, today. For those of you who I haven't had a chance to talk about HIV, I take care of about uh, 750 HIV patients who, who live essentially uh, normal uh, or near normal uh, lifespans uh, now, and it's most of them are, are taken one pill once a day. Um, we have about 90% of our patients who are undetectable, meaning they're fully suppressed, living normal lives. We struggle with that 10% and actually spend a lot of our resources uh, uh, on those folks. But again, this is a very manageable uh, disease. These patients are having ever expanding. Uh, roles in routine health care, uh, high level health care such as transplants uh, and the like. Excuse me, MDR gonorrhea, multidrug resistant gonorrhea. This is a big, uh, big issue. If you have an interest in this, there's a very nice uh, three minute video on the uh, CDC website uh, with respect to gonorrhea that uh, 
that uh, documents the uh, progression of antimicrobial uh, resistance over time. Uh, and this, this actually is going to pose a huge uh, outpatient problem, probably our biggest outpatient problem uh, as it relates to multidrug resistant organisms. As you recall, gonorrhea t is typically not uh, subtle. A diagnosis can be made off of a gram stain. However, most of us now use the nucleic acid amplification test uh, to make the diagnosis. I leave culture in there in the middle because it's actually culture that's incredibly important uh, to what the CDC does in tracking uh, gonococcal resistance. So this is the gonococcal isolate surveillance program uh, that looks at the first 25 male isolates each month at a select center across the country and documents uh, antimicrobial susceptibilities. And over time, uh, and, and as gonorrhea has become progressively resistant, our choices have, begun, have become progressively few uh, to where we just now have one. One choice, okay? Ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams IM plus azithromycin. The way this has changed, if you trained 10 or 15 years ago as we were given azithromycin in case there was chlamydia. Now we're using azithromycin not only for that, but we're using also as an adjunctive therapy uh, for, uh, uh, for gonorrhea. But with that, we get the report about six weeks ago of this case of drug-resistant supergonorrhea. So this is ceftriaxone-resistant, azithromycin-resistant gonorrhea in a Brit who had, who had uh, uh, con uh, contracted gonorrhea while on a trip to Southeast Asia where, the, where most of the resistance uh, has tend to, tended to start. And so this patient was actually treated with ertapenem. That was the only agent that they could determine that, that, would, that would cure this uh, person. So we're going to be looking at all parental, potentially at all parenteral therapy uh, down the road and limited options uh, at, least, at least as they exist today for the treatment of gonorrhea. And I'll finish just with a couple of comments about hepatitis C. I want to remind everybody of the living document that's online, hcvguidelines.org, um, that because of the rapidity at which this field has moved over the last couple of years has been an invaluable resource uh, as we try to manage and keep up with the information uh, and treatments available for these patients with respect to directly uh, acting anti antivirals. And then finally, I wanted to introduce you to STEP Tennessee, which is a program that we've been involved with at Chattanooga Cares, now called SEMPA, uh, which where we are, we're going to be offering uh, needle exchange uh, given the passage of legislation in Tennessee that allows that. Just as a reminder on how you can help with the hepatitis C epidemic, we need to be routinely screening our patients as outlined uh, in the HCV guidelines uh, document. Um, the, probably the most important recommendation that often gets overlooked uh, in our practices is the one-time hepatitis C uh, testing that's recommended for individuals born between 1945 and 1965. And although the epidemiology with the opioid epidemic is evolving uh, with respect to hepatitis C, as I'll detail in just a moment, a proc when this recommendation was made, approximately 75% of people of, uh, living in this country uh, with HIV were born within that age cohort. So we, we've got highly effective therapies. These are going to be the patients who are going to be at highest risk to already have uh, some degree of liver disease, and these are patients we can effectively cure. Uh, with 8 to 12 weeks of therapy, of, a, of relatively well-tolerated therapy if we can capture them. Uh, again, just published as a perspective uh, six weeks ago or so uh, in uh, New England Journal, the, the, uh, the, the look uh, or the merger of what we're often seeing on our service and your services uh, right now is the merger of injection drug use, hepatitis C, uh, and uh, endocarditis. And hepatitis C is definitely a major long-term uh, consequence uh, that is uh, extremely pre prevalent on the order of 90 percent amongst our injection drug users. Uh, and it's with that that I, I just bring this to your attention that we have this syringe trade and education program uh, where, we're partnering, where we're leading and partnering with ETSU to have mobile rural, clinic, uh, mo mobile rural access uh, to needle exchange with three major benefits. 
people have a safe place uh, to dispose of used needles and, uh, the, and, and to drive uh, down uh, transmission of diseases like HIV and hepatitis C. So this is something uh, that we're just getting going uh, here uh, in the surrounding counties as well as up in the Tri-Cities uh, area. So I'll close to say infectious diseases, like other specialties, continues to rapidly uh, evolve. I feel like there are many easily operationalized opportunities for trainees, hospitalists, primary care physicians, and other specialists to maximize quality and improve outcomes in their patients with infectious diseases. So I'll stop and be happy to take any questions. <clears throat>